good place to begin is always the beginning. And my beginning was 41 years ago in 1945 when I was born in New York City at Beth Israel Hospital. My Hebrew name given to me at birth is Sarah Rivka. I was raised in an Orthodox Jewish home, or as we say, an observant Jewish home. We observed both the biblical and rabbinical commandments. As a young adult, I married a Jewish man from a similar background, and we had a beautiful baby daughter named Elisa. Her Hebrew name is Chavalea. She's now 18 years old, and she's in college. When Elisa was very young, her father and I divorced. We had to get a Jewish divorce, which is called a get. And this would enable us to then remarry other Jewish people within the Orthodox synagogue community. This would enable us to be able to have an Orthodox wedding ceremony. When Elisa was six years old, we moved to Los Angeles. We lived in the Fairfax area of Los Angeles, which is the Orthodox community. Elisa was enrolled at Yavne Yeshiva, and I worked in the garment center, which is a predominantly Jewish industry. My mom and dad moved out shortly thereafter, and we moved down to Orange County, where I went into real estate, and that's where I met my husband, because my husband owned a real estate company. When I met my husband, the only thing he said about his religious background was that he was Protestant. He didn't say anything about church or Christianity or Jesus. If he had, we probably never would have gotten together because up until that time, all my friends were Jewish. I remember my mom and dad saying to me that this is a man who has a Jewish heart. Ron, my husband, became very involved within the Jewish community. He learned our Jewish ways and readily accepted them. We were engaged for a year and then we were married. Shortly after we married, we became involved with Chabad of Irvine. In fact, we helped build the Chabad of Irvine synagogue. I was very involved with the Chabad women's group. In fact, I would drive Rachel, the rabbi's wife, to the meetings and then would drive her home. Our home was used for Jewish outreach. We had some of the women's functions at our home. I headed up Chabad Bowling. And we were very much involved with the Jewish synagogue. Our daughter attended Hebrew Academy Yeshiva. I soon began to feel that my husband should have a kosher conversion to Judaism. A kosher conversion is an orthodox conversion. And the reason we chose to have an orthodox conversion is because we were involved with the orthodox synagogue. Also, an orthodox conversion is readily accepted both here in the United States and in Israel. And this was very important to us. I explained to my husband that there were basically three ceremonies involved with having a kosher conversion. The first is water immersion into a mikvah. This is done for purification and identification. The second is circumcision for the male who wishes to be converted to Judaism. Now, in the case of my husband, who's already been circumcised, what the rabbis do is they draw a little bit of blood, and this is symbolic of a circumcision. The third step is the person wishing to be converted must appear before a bet din. Now, a bet din is a court of rabbis. And the person wishing to be converted appears before this bet din and renounces whatever they believed in before. If they believed in Buddhism, then they renounce Buddha. If they are believe in a cult, then they would renounce the cult. In my husband's case, since the only thing that he ever mentioned about his religion was that he was a Protestant, I just presumed that he would renounce Jesus. At which point, he said, I don't think I can do that. Well, I have to tell you, I went into shock at that point because you have to picture this. Here is a man living his life as a Jew, sending his daughter to Hebrew Academy, helping to build the synagogue in Irvine, 
using our home for Jewish outreach. He had never mentioned anything about church or Christianity or Jesus. And I was, I always thought Jesus was pagan, was Roman mythology. And I remember saying to my husband that morning, you're such a successful businessman. How can you believe in something so pagan? It's Roman mythology. Well, I called in my daughter. I said, Elisa, you're not going to believe this. Your father says he can't renounce Jesus. And then I received um, an inspiration. That's all that I can say. In a moment, the thought had come to me. Well, I'll just begin to read the Bible, my Jewish Bible. And pretty soon I'll be able to show my husband how Jesus could never have been the fulfillment of the Old Testament. You see, there was one thing that I knew, and that was that everything that God ever wanted us Jews to know about his Messiah, so that we Jews would be able to recognize him, would be in the Jewish Bible. When Jewish people go to synagogue, we do hear the Bible. We hear a portion from the Torah, and we hear a portion from the prophets. But what I had decided to do was to literally open up the Bible from the very first page and begin reading all the way through. I didn't think it'd take me too long. I thought, gee, pretty soon after the first few pages, I would be able to find that scripture that would prove to my husband Jesus could never have been the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Well, that morning I went downstairs and I opened up my Bible and I began reading. Before I started to read, each time I opened up my Bible, I prayed to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to please show me the truth. Because I wasn't taking any chances. I didn't want any outside influence coming in. My husband went off to work and my daughter went off to school. And there I was in the family room reading my Jewish Bible. One side in Hebrew, one side in English. Most Jewish homes have a Bible like this. They would come home hours later, my daughter from school, my husband from work, and I'd still be reading. My husband went off to work the next morning and my daughter went to school, and I was still reading. And they came home from work and school hours later, and I'd still be reading. And this went on for days. It went on for weeks. When I finished reading the Bible, I realized that all of these Messianic prophecies all pointed to Jesus, or what I had heard about Jesus. And I was shocked. I was amazed at what I was reading. For example, in Isaiah 49, we read about the servant of Israel, the Messiah. And he is lamenting to God that he failed to bring back or to reconcile the 12 tribes of Israel. And we hear God answering him, saying, it's too light a thing or it's too small a thing for me to send you to the 12 tribes of Israel. I will give you to all the nations of the world. And the word nations in Hebrew is goyim or Gentile. So what we're hearing is the servant of Israel, or the Messiah, saying he failed to bring back Israel to God, or reconcile Israel to God. And we hear God answering, saying, it's too small a thing for me to send you to the 12 tribes of Israel. I'll give you to all the Gentiles. I had never heard this before. Well, when I finished reading the Bible, I had made a decision that I was not going to believe in Jesus. I must be missing something. I couldn't believe that my rabbis wouldn't see this. So I went to the Jewish bookstore and began reading books on Jewish history. And then I read the Talmud. I read the Targumim. I read Midrash. 
We bought the Encyclopedia Judaica. You know, the rabbis tell us that we cannot read the Bible without the Jewish commentaries. So I went to the bookstore and I bought the Jewish commentaries. Rashi commentary, Sansino commentaries, and the Art Scroll Tanakh series, Misura Publications. One of the interesting things that I found in all my reading was that the ancient Jewish sages had also a problem with the two pictures of the Messiah depicted in the Jewish Bible. And they had names for these two different pictures of the Messiah. The suffering servant was called Mashiach ben Yosef, or Messiah, son of Joseph. And the picture of the Messiah coming in glory, he was called Mashiach ben David, or Messiah, son of David. All of these writings that were written centuries ago that I was reading that concerned itself with the Messiah, describing how he would live his life, who he would be, what he would accomplish. All these writings that were written prior to Jesus walking on the earth, all these Jewish writings concerned with the Messiah All of these sounded so much like they were fulfilled in Jesus. And once again, I made the decision, I'm not going to believe in Jesus. And so the only thing left for me to do was to call up my rabbi. And I did. I called up Mendo, and I asked him and his wife, Rachel, to please come to my home. I showed them my books, and I asked them to help me. Rabbi said to me that there was an expert in this field who he was sure could help me. His name was Rabbi Benzion Kravitz. He's a programmer. A few days later, I received a phone call from Rabbi Benzion Kravitz. He came to my home, and the first time we met, we debated for approximately 10 hours straight. We talked about the scriptures, traditions, and Jewish history. And what I realized was that he was coming from a very modern approach, like many of the rabbis today are. And I was coming from a very traditional approach about who the Messiah would be. The second time we met was at his home. We discussed a book that was written by Maimonides called Guide to the Perplexed. This book was written because Maimonides' students were having a problem with all the anthropomorphic appearances of God throughout the Jewish Bible. And Maimonides had written this book to offer some sort of explanation to his students. Rabbi Kravitz gave me a book to read at this time by an author who lives in Brooklyn, New York, called Gerald Siegel. The name of the book is The Jewish Response to Christian Missionary. Prior to this time, I had gone to the Jewish bookstore in the Fairfax area and purchased every book I could find on anti-missionary and cult literature. Uh, to give you an example of the types of books they are, one of the titles is You Take Jesus, I'll Take God. And I had read all these books, and here was another book, and uh, I took it home, and in the margins of the book, I gave my argument to the statements that Gerald Siegel was giving in his book. And then Rabbi Kravitz felt that perhaps Gerald Siegel could help me. So Gerald Siegel would call me collect on Monday nights. He would give me a problem to solve concerning the Bible or Jesus or Christianity. And I would study and solve the problem, tell him about it the following Monday, where he would then give me some other problem to solve, and I would study again all week and then give him back the answer on that Monday. And this went on for a long, long time. And every time he called, I would give him back the answer to his arguments. And then he called up Rabbi Kravitz and told him that he didn't think he could help me. At this time, I was becoming an embarrassment to the Jewish community. Mendel called me after hearing from Rabbi Kravitz that there didn't seem to be any help for me. 
Mendeley called and said that there's an expert, an internationally known deprogrammer, who is coming to our area. And would I go in here and speak? And I said, yes. I went to the Hebrew Academy to hear this internationally known deprogrammer. His name is Rabbi Emanuel Shachet. Alisa, Ron, and I had decided before we attended the meeting that I wouldn't be saying anything during the course of the evening, but that after the program was over, I would quietly approach Rabbi Shachet and ask him if he could help me. Well, we went to the meeting, and after Rabbi Shachet spoke, he offered to answer any questions from the audience. The first person raised their hand and said, Rabbi Shachet, we're having a problem with the deprogrammers in the area. They're quoting scripture to our children, and we don't know what to tell them. Rabbi Shachet had said to the audience, you don't have to worry if you raise your children in a Jewish environment, give them a good Jewish upbringing, you won't have a problem. Well, now the next person raises their hand and says, Rabbi Shachet, we are having a very bad problem with the missionaries in our area because they are quoting scriptures to our children. They're having Bible study. And we don't know what to tell our children. Rabbi Shachet looked out at the audience, and he said, Listen, if you raise your children in a Jewish home and give them a good Jewish education, send them to Hebrew school, you won't have a problem. Now the third person raises their hand and says, Rabbi Shachet, we are having a major problem in this area with Christian missionaries because they're holding Bible studies, and our children are coming home with scriptures that we've never heard before, and we don't know how to explain it to them. At which point, Rabbi Shachet, now you have to picture this, he was standing on a platform, and there was a podium in front of him, and he grabbed the sides of the podium and pulled his body over the podium as if he was looming out into the audience and in a loud booming voice he said never under any circumstances does any one with a good Jewish background who knows their Judaism ever under any circumstances turns to Christianity or that man and he meant Jesus well I really thought he was speaking to me we were sitting in the second row right in the center and it looked like he was just speaking right to me. And I grabbed Elisa's hand, and I grabbed Ron's hand, and I said, can I say something? Should I say something? And they said, yes. And so I raised my hand, and I said, Rabbi, what do you tell someone like me? I'm an observant Jewish woman. I know my Judaism. And yet when I read the Jewish Bible, I see Jesus. Well, from that point until the end of the evening, he and I were in a direct debate. We discussed the scriptures, tradition, and Jewish history. We were debating one-to-one -one on these subjects. And it was really an unusual situation because here's an eminent scholar debating with a Jewish woman in, orthodox, in an orthodox setting. And this is highly unusual. During the course of the evening, he became highly emotional, at times very volatile, and even at times was not aware of the things that he was saying. He was pulling scripture out of context. Uh, what I would like to do is just uh, give you an example for how the evening went. I'll give you just one example of where the rabbi just got carried away. He didn't realize what he was saying. We were talking about Jesus, and he was describing Jesus on the cross, where Jesus was saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the rabbi said, Jesus blasphemed God when he said that. And he proceeded to repeat that scripture in a loud, ugly voice. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Just in a very, very ugly voice. And he said, when Jesus said that, he was blaspheming God. What the rabbi had forgotten in his emotional state was that scripture was first spoken by our beloved King David in Psalm 22 in the Old Testament. Well, that is pretty much how the evening went. I began to see that once again, 
these rabbis were coming from a very modern approach to scripture. And I was coming from a very traditional approach. Also, I could see a blindness. You know, Paul speaks of this in Romans. He says that there has been this partial blindness that God has put on the Jew for a time. And I saw this blindness. I went home that evening, and I said to my husband, I don't have any more doubts. I don't have any more questions. It is true. Jesus is my Jewish Messiah. I went on my knees to God that evening. And I would just like to leave you with this, this thought. When Paul is speaking in Romans to the Gentiles, and he tells them that you who were afar off have now been brought near to God. You've now been grafted into this Jewish olive tree with the Jewish root. He tells them that because of this partial blindness that God has put on the Jew for a time, but only for a time, that they have been brought near and that they have now become part of the commonwealth of Israel.